This morning we're going to look at a doctrine that has infiltrated some churches. And uh, I wouldn't say it's, I say mainstream, it's not as big, and it's not as big as, say, Calvinism, the errors of Calvinism, but it certainly is an error that I want to address. And um, it'll be good for us because there's a, it's, it's quite a fine line between truth and error. And um, it's a dangerous doctrine. And you've got to be careful not to slip into this. Occasionally, you know, you can um, get something wrong and follow the crowd. So we're going to look at the error of hyper-dispensationalism. Hyper-dispensationalism. It's a big word, isn't it? And anything hyper is over, beyond, above, excessive, above normal. Now, I am a dispensationalist. I believe that God deals with different people at different times in his purpose and his plans. And um, if, you're, if you believe in the Old Testament and New Testament, uh, you're a dispensationalist. Two, two, you know, two covenants there, two gospels there. Um, so really everyone who's a Christian should be. But um, we're going to look at this in some depth this morning. But first I want to take you to um, a few scriptures. Hebrews 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 to 14. We get all kinds of letters, all kinds of emails from people that, you know, challenge your stand. If you take a, a stand on anything, people want to challenge you. And um, a lot of time wasters we get. And uh, even this morning, Sunday morning, we've had two emails even this morning of uh, one guy who's up in arms because he's a Pentecostal and he wants to challenge us that we don't believe in signs and wonders for today and all this kind of stuff. Here we have uh, verse 12. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That's Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. That's a great passage that sets the scene. That there are many baby Christians out there who don't study the scriptures, don't rightly divide them. And they'll be poor from pillar to post. They're unskillful in the word of God. And we're trying to learn um, the scriptures, we're trying to learn the doctrines and asking God to lead and guide us. And um, we submit to this book, this is our final authority. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 2 says, I have fed you with milk. In fact, start verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. A lot of these you can't, these Christians. But as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk. And not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. You can't reason with the Calvinists, or these hyper-dispensationalists. They're baby Christians, they're shallow students of the word, sadly to say. And again, just on this introduction, look at 2 Peter 1.20. <clears throat> You've got to be careful... The way you read this book, 2 Peter 1.20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. It's not to be interpreted privately. You don't have your own little sect, your own little slant on things. It's got to be in context. Catholics make lots of private interpretations, hence why they build such a massive empire. All the cults take the scripture, their, their favourite scripture to build an empire on as a private interpretation. Two more. 2 Peter 2, how do we understand the scriptures? Sorry, 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. The key to understanding the scripture. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You've got to rightly divide that book. If you don't, you'll mess up on your doctrine all the way through. And the last one, 1 Corinthians 2, 
1 Corinthians 2, verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. This is a spiritual book. We compare scripture with scripture. That's how we understand the Bible. So we rightly, or try to, rightly divide this book. But the hyper-dispensationalist wrongly divides the book. Their proof text is Ephesians 3. Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> verse 2. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, would. That's their proof text. We'll deal with that later on. Okay. So let's have a walk through this. A while back now, a guy from America, his name was Gary Miller, I think it was, um, sent me an email saying that he'd come across our website and that he loved our stand on the authorised version Bible saying it's perfect. And um, saw what we were doing, saw our ministry, and said, I'd like to send you some of my books. So we said, okay, that's fine, send them. So he did. And um, he did one on the perfection of the authorised version Bible. And I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that Chick actually published it for him. And it was a good book. It's only a thin you know, booklet, but it was a good one. And um, then he sent me all this other stuff as well. And that's when the problem started to arise, to arise. Um, a lot of people, especially a lot of um, cults, a lot of people who are in error in their doctrine, who have an overemphasis on something, like a hyper-Calvinist or a hyper-dispensationist, they'll always come across as really nice at the start. It's something that it happened at Welcome Hall with their elders. They all come across as nice and pious and all this lovely, you know, oh, where are you from, and all this real nice stuff, before they want to get their hookers in you to teach you something to get you off track. And this is what this guy did, this Gary Miller. Um, he proceeded to tell us that it was great that we were rightly dividing the scriptures. Yet he couldn't rightly divide letters, let alone sentences. But alarm bells rang as I was reading some of his material, and I didn't spend long on it. Um, listen, I'll read, to, I'll read to you some of the stuff that he wrote, so you can pick up some of these, like, cult phrases. Hello, John, hope all is well with you and yours. I also hope you have read and studied the Grace books. The grace books we sent to you. An overemphasis, remember? Hyper, overemphasis on grace. If you have, you will have seen from the scriptures that we live in the dispensation of the grace of God. That was given by the risen Christ to the apostle Paul. Paul preaches salvation by grace. God changed his program or dispensation with the salvation of Saul of Tarsus. We do not find our gospel. Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day until we hear it from Paul. It's God's, it's God's given commission 2 Corinthians 5 19 to 21 now turn there because this is one if they if anybody takes you to this passage 2 Corinthians 5 21 um, 19 to 21 is it that one yes um, Verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. A hyper-dispensationalist will always take you to that passage over 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel message. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Dead, death, burial, resurrection. That's the gospel message for today. But a hyper, a HP, we call them hyper-diapers, Reason being because a diaper is a nappy and these are babies, as we've just looked at. A hyperdiaper will take you to this verse, verse 19, and talk about the ministry of reconciliation. You've got to be careful with that. So that's a sign to recognise whether you're dealing with a person in a cult. Now this is really interesting as well, especially what we've been looking at recently. 
um, and we'll get into this as we go. A person who doesn't talk about repentance has had dealings with a hyper-dispensationalist saying that repentance is not for today. We'll look at that. When it, comes to, when it talks about repentance regarding works, then I agree with that. But when they take out the word repentance all the time, they've been tarnished by the hyper-dispensationalist. So it's going to be quite an in-depth study. We're going to go, be jumping all around the place. Maybe not your cup of tea, but it needs to be said. It needs to be put on CD, and it needs to be sent out as well to these cults and this cult. So, what else have we got before we get into this? Oh, yeah, they reject water baptism. We'll get into that also. In fact, we'll start with that. Um, number one, they reject water baptism. As already stated, the hyperdipers get hung up on non-baptism. No water baptism for this dispensation. Yet, what do the scriptures teach? Well, if you go to Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, verse 31. I'll start at 30, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. This is Paul here. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptised. He and all his straightway. So Paul baptised. They, they state that they want to follow Paul, yet he baptised. Paul does not tell him to repent and be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sin, but rather he tells him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. This is the teaching of Ephesians and Romans. So it's perfectly apparent that in Acts 16, even though Paul knew the gospel of the grace of God, he still baptised the convert after getting him saved, through, saved by grace through faith. Now this is the other one, I, again, I'm a slow learner, it takes me a while to get these things. There's different gospels in scripture. And um, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, is not the gospel. We don't preach that gospel today. But it isn't even a gospel message. Because nobody in Acts chapter 2 is asking, what must I do to be saved? They're saying, what shall we do that we've crea you know, crucified the... Um, Messiah. So they're asking, what shall we do? So it's not a gospel message. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And what a hyper uh, dispensationist will do, he'll take you to Galatians, turn to Galatians, chapter 2 verse 7. Again, we'll deal with this a little bit later. But contrary wise, when they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter they, they read two gospels in that that Peter and Paul preached different gospels yet we know um, according to verse uh, chapter 1 Galatians chapter 1 if any man preach any other gospel, where is it? Yeah, um, there, verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So if Peter is preaching a different gospel to Paul, he's accursed. So we obviously didn't. Paul had to shed light on things. Things were changing, of course. That's why you don't build your, you don't build your doctrine on the book of Acts, because it's a transition period. So there's four Gospels in the New Testament. Acts 2.38 is not one of them. Now, I fell into this error before, yeah? Uh, previously, when I first started looking at this. So, the four, the four different Gospels in the New Testament are as follows. Number one, the Gospel of the Kingdom. That's number one. The Gospel of the Kingdom, that's a Gospel. Paul's Gospel, the death, burial and resurrection. Paul's Gospel. Then there is Galatians 1, verse 8, another Gospel. So that's another Gospel. That's the third one. And then in Revelation, and we'll come to these again in a bit, um, you've got the everlasting Gospel, which isn't even preached by a human being. It's 
preached by an angel. That's the four main gospels. The kingdom, Paul's gospel, another gospel, and the everlasting. We realise it's faith and works in the Old Testament. It goes back to faith and works in the tribulation. But now it's the gospel of the grace of God. So the blood atonement, the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, the hyperdispensation gets hung up on that you shouldn't baptise. Baptism is not for today. And they follow men, and it all sort of was instigated by people like um, Bullinger, E. Bullinger, who did the Companion Bible, a big, thick Bible, probably one of the best study Bibles, yet he was a hyper-dispensationalist. He believed in soul sleep and things like that. So Bullinger is one, J.C. O'Hare is another, a guy called Baker is another, and the big one is Cornelius Stamm. And when I first started learning about rightly dividing the word of truth, there was another guy called Herbert Rausch. And I followed him a little way. And it's as if God led me off a different path. Because there was something not quite right with his ministry also. And he turned out to be a hyper-dispensationalist. Bullinger Bullinger taught that only the prison epistles written by Paul after the close of the book of Acts could be considered as doctrine for the Christian. He also taught that the body found in the book of Acts is not the body of Christ mentioned in Ephesians 2 and 3. So he saw two bodies, and he also said that it's only Paul's letters that are for today, for the church, for today. Everything else you're to disregard. So it's just Paul's letters. Bullinger also taught that the mystery body... Paul mentions in Ephesians 2 and 3, did not show up until after the close of Acts 28. Yet Bullinger was wrong here because in 1 Corinthians 12, dealing with the mystery body and the members in the body, we read, for by one spirit, verse 13, for by one spirit are we all baptised into one body. And one question the hyperdispensationalists find very difficult to answer and many disagree with each other, is when did the body of Christ start? And I've got some interesting stuff on that, um, which we'll talk about. When did the body of Christ start? Some say it started in Acts chapter 9, when Paul got saved. Some say Acts chapter 13. Some say Acts chapter 18. And some say Acts chapter 28. And those guys there, Bullinger, O'Hare, Baker, Cornelius, and they all disagree with each other. There's a very interesting, um, they say it started with Paul, and they're so hung up on Paul, when did the body of Christ start? Yet if you turn to Romans 16, Romans 16, look at verse 7. Salute Andronicus and Junior, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ when? Before me. So the body of Christ, the church, was before Paul. You remember that verse, especially when you're speaking to one of these cult members, because there was Christians in the body of Christ before Paul. That's a good verse. If it was wrong for Paul to baptise, don't you think that there would have been a chapter devoted to it? For example, did you notice the difference... In Simon Peter, in Acts 11, when he found out that he had been wrong in telling the people that they had to be baptised in water to receive the Holy Ghost. Why, when Peter rehearses the matter, he says in Acts 11, verse 15 to 18, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us, at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptised with water, but ye shall be baptised with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. When Simon Peter found out that a man didn't have to be baptised in water to receive the Holy Ghost, he explained it, he made a speech on it, he rehearsed it, he gave it to the brethren, and then made a final declarative, which means the nature of making a declaration, statement on it in Acts 15, verse 11. But we believe, listen, this is Paul's, this is Peter's gospel, turn there, Acts 15, this is what P 
Peter preached the same gospel that Paul preached, not a different gospel. Acts 15, verse 11, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. It's the grace of God. Paul would have done the same if he found out that it was wrong to baptise his converts in water. When they quote, for Christ sent me not to baptise but to preach the gospel, which is one of their favourite texts, the hyper-dispensationist either quotes half a verse or they quote it out of context, which is what we said at the start. Look at the following, 1 Corinthians 1, 12. 1 Corinthians 1, 12 to 17. 1 Corinthians 1, 12 to 17. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptised in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptised none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, so he baptised. Lest any should say that I had baptised in mine own name, and I baptised also the household of Stephanus, or Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptised any other. For Christ sent me not to baptise, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. No, Paul wasn't a pastor, he was a, an evangelist also. Now the context of 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17 has nothing at all to do with the doing away of water baptism because of any advanced revelation. The context of verses 14 to 17 is plainly dealing with arguments of people who baptised them and Paul was thanking God that he hadn't been responsible for that, lest, for that lest they claim him against the rest. Look at verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified? Or were you baptised in the name of Paul? Note also that he baptised Crispus and Gaius and the household of Stephanus and some, and some more whose names he had forgotten. Even though Paul was not sent primarily to baptise, he did baptise his convert, converts. Paul wasn't a pastor of a local congregation. He was a travelling evangelist. Hyperdispensation are very good at giving you the part truth rather than all the truth. Cornelius Stamm and E. Bullinger, and these are the idols of the hyperdipers, just like um, Calvinists for the Calvinists, think that some, something cannot be revealed until it is present, and that if it isn't revealed, it isn't there. They deny this, but that is the truth. We shall see this as we progress. Turn to Ephesians 3, verse 1 and 2. It'll be a bit bitty, but hopefully it will pull together at the end. So just bear with me if you can. Ephesians 3, verse 1 and 2. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, would, Stan reads this as one age, the dispensation of grace. But of course, it is not saying that. The verses are talking about God dispensing grace to Paul. If he had heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, would. One of the errors that's made today in regard to this is um, what it is, what does dispensationalism mean? What is it? And some people say, well, the dispensation, that we are living in the dispensation of grace, it's a time period. But a time period was never dispensed to an apostle. That's ludicrous. Because there's another thing that says the dispensation of God. It doesn't make sense. So it's not a time period, but it's, beca it's become, um, in our understanding, to be a time period. People think it's a time period. But this is what it means. The word, well, in fact, let's start from the beginning, because you need to get this. This is important to studying the scriptures, to understanding what the Bible's about. Dispensationalism is a framework for understanding the Bible. It is a system of Bible interpretation. In essence, dispensationalism is a period of stewardship. That's the key. It's a period of stewardship during which a man or man is tested during God's dealing with him. So a dispensation is an administration or dispensing of God's will over a certain period of time to a certain group of people. The whole Bible is written for us, for our learning, but not all of it is addressed to us. Romans 15 verse 4. 
For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. That's from Genesis to Malachi. That's from Genesis to Revelation, really, but when Paul is writing, that's the Old Testament. So the word dispensation means the laws by which a household is operated, or the way the master of a house arranges his household. Still, the word has been used ever since 1700 to mean a period of time. And that's where the problem arises. This, of course, is due to the master of the house. Look at Hebrews 3. This is interesting. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 2. Who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. That's a good one. Ephesians 2.19 now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. The household of God. I'm taking a lot of this information from issue 55 of Time for Truth News. So if you want to get this in a little bit more detail, you need to get that copy. Just going through this because I think there's something else in here. Hold on one memento. Okay, we have to come back to that. Okay, so God sets up different ways of running his family at different times according to his own wisdom. The word dispense means to give out, a dispensary, a dispensary of drugs, for instance. A dispensation is not a period of time, but a manner or method which God sets up during a period of time, which will operate during that period. Like we said before, Colossians 1.25, you can't have a dispensation of God. There's no such thing. The word dispensation is found four times in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 9.17, Ephesians 1.10, Ephesians 3.2 and Colossians 1.25. Dispensationalism can also be termed stewardship or administration. And every verse of scripture has three applications. Past, historical, present, devotional or spiritual application, and future, doctrinal or prophetic application. So that's how we understand the scriptures. It's, people keep saying, well, it's your interpretation. No, we're looking at scripture in, in its context, rightly dividing it, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, comparing scripture with scripture. What does the scripture actually say? Not what you think it means. What does it actually say? So getting back to this, back to, where were we? Ephesians 3, turn there again, Ephesians 3. We'll read... Verses 1 to 9. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, would, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Note that down, that most of the mysteries were, were revealed to Paul, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of this promise in Christ by the gospel. Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, that's the key, given unto me by the effectual working of his power, unto me who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. If you're going to say that the dispensation of the grace of God is a time period, you're mad. You can't rightly divide the word of truth. It is, um, it is God dispensing his grace so that Paul understood what the mystery of the body of Christ, the mystery of Christ, um, the Jew and Gentile in one body, like I said before, most of the mysteries were revealed to Paul. Look up the word in any concordance. So verse 5, 
when in other ages was ma- not made known unto us, unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed, i.e. when it took place unto his holy apostles. Verse 7, Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me. See how that matches verse 2. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me, to you would, unto me, verse 8, who am least, who am less than the least of all saints, is the grace, is this grace given. There is that given again. Three times you are told that the dispensation was the handing out of grace to Paul, so he could understand. It had nothing to do with any period of time. Ephesians 3 eight. unto me who am, the, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. The trouble with this reading is that somebody is confusing when the thing took place with the time it was revealed. Also, Paul is writing to the Ephesians, and he was dealing with the Ephesians back in Acts 19 and 20, and at, that, and at this time, he already knows the mystery. Paul knew about the mystery of the one body in 1 Corinthians 12, and this places it before Acts 18, in time. Not like some of the hyperdipers say about having it after Acts 28, which is what like Bullinger says. So you have to be very careful following men like Stam and Bullinger. Gary Miller, the guy who contacted me recently in regard to our website, which someone had recommended to him, couldn't wait to tell me that he believed the AV was perfect, and he goes on and on, and he comes back, and then he starts hitting with all this doctrine. All this stuff out of context. And he starts talking about the gospel of reconciliation. And takes you to the um, 2 Corinthians instead of 1 Corinthians 15. Right, let me just give you the next part. I like what Ruckman writes regarding this. We believe, we Bible-believing Baptists have taught two things for many years. We've taught that the local church did not begin at Pentecost. That's interesting. This is perfectly clear in the passage in Matthew 16 and 18, the calling out of the twelve and in the commissioning of this local church in Matthew, 20, in Matthew 28 and Acts 1. This group has a roll of 120 names on it in Acts 1. It had a treasurer who died and was replaced in Acts 1 and Matthew 26. It had a leader who was a spokesman for the group, Simon Peter, Acts 1 and 2. It was local, it was a called out assembly, called out and chosen of by the Lord. As such, it was a Jewish church. It certainly had Jews and Gentiles in it after Pentecost. This local church became a living organism and its members were placed in Christ by a baptism of the Holy Spirit. When Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 4 and 5, there is one body and one spirit, even as as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. He can only refer to the same Holy Spirit and the same baptism that put the Pentecostal disciples, Cornelius' family, the Apostle Paul himself and the Ephesians into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 For by one Spirit we are all baptised into one body whether we be Jews or Gentiles whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. I'm jumping ahead now but I found this very interesting. Turn to John 17. The Lord's Prayer. Peter, James and John, John 17, um, Jesus praying to his Father in verse 21. um, Verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. Listen carefully, verse 23. I in them. Did you get that? That's good, isn't it? Christ in us, you're in Christ. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Very interesting passage that. If we get time, we'll come back to it. This is why it's so dangerous to build your doctrine in the book of Acts like the Pentecostals do. In the book of Acts, one group of people have to be baptised to receive the Holy Ghost. Acts 2, another group receive the Holy Ghost before they are baptised. Acts 10, another man is born again before he is baptised in water. Acts 9, 
Another group believe and are saved and are baptized without receiving the Holy Ghost. Acts 8. Another group of people get saved and get baptized and don't speak in tongues until hands are laid on them. Acts 19. There is one baptism, one body, and one spirit. Acts is a very dangerous book to build your doctrine on. So, here comes a question that the hyper-dispensationalists dread. Were Peter, James, and John in the body of Christ? If so, when did this take place? Look at John 17, verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. There's Peter, James, and John. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. There's Peter, James, and John. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given them unto the words, given them, I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and they have surely, and, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. There's Peter, James, and John. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. There's Peter, James, and John. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. There's Peter, James and John, all the way through. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they may that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Do you get that? There is one baptism, one body, one spirit. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So are Peter, James and John in Christ? Are they in his body? According to that passage they are. This is the difference between a Bible believing Christian who can rightly divide the word, note the small w, of truth and a hyper dispensation who wrongly divides the word of truth. Jesus Christ was in Peter, James and John and Peter, James and John were going to be in him baptized by the Spirit of God and this would take place at Pentecost. How could they have gotten into Christ before then? He had no body for them to be in as he was sitting opposite them. He didn't come into them when he arose from the dead. He simply breathed upon them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, John twenty twenty two. There is only one place where one spirit could have baptized Peter, James and John into one body. And this one body that one spirit baptizes into is the same one mentioned in Corinthians and Ephesians. One spirit, one body, one baptism. I can imagine it will be a little bit confusing, but you need to hear this. In Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Paul is talking about the baptism that saves. There is only one baptism that saves, and it's not water baptism. This baptism put them into Christ. It is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see, God used multiple means and multiple methods in manifesting things throughout the book of Acts with the same spirit and the same baptism. Bible believers understand that Stamites, Bullingerites, and all the hyper-dispensationalists don't, yet they profess to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. If Peter, James, and John were not in Jesus Christ, you're not either, and neither is Paul. 
John 17, verse 23, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. I think that's good. Turn to Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God, there's that stewardship again, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. There are prophets in the body of Christ. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Therefore the apostles were in the body of Christ. And so were the prophets. Not only that, but read it again a little further. Ephesians 2, 19, uh, Ephesians 3, verse 1. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Ephesians 3 verse 1 for this cause and Paul goes straight into the body mystery go back to Ephesians 2 verse 11 15 wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by what? The blood of Christ. For he is our peace who, past tense, not when he got the body mystery, not when the mystery was revealed in the, in the late Acts period, past tense, hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in the flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments. When did he do this? When he died on the cross, see verse 16. Containing ordinances to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. The fact the Gentiles didn't enter that body until they got saved in Acts 2 and in Acts 8, the Ethiopian eunuch, and the fact that the pure Gentiles who were weren't Jewish proselytes, didn't get into that body until Acts 13, 14, 15 and 16, means nothing. The way was made for them to get in there when Christ died on the cross, according to verse 16. And it was preached to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. It got preached first at Jerusalem to a group of Jews and then to those afar off, i.e. the Gentiles. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. It is also very interesting to note at this point that every hyper-dispensationist, Stamite, Bullingerite Christian has never got his own church started, maintained or grown. Why? Because you'll find out that most of those, in fact probably nearly all of them, turn out to be five-point Calvinists. Most members of these cultic clubs have been stolen from other churches. They just don't win souls. So it's not just the hyper-Calvinist that doesn't win souls, it's the hyper-dispensationist that doesn't win souls. They're not interested in evangelism. The dying thief on the cross believed on Jesus as the kingly Messiah instead of the exact manner later revealed in the Pauline epistles, yet he was still saved. You have, I'm sure this raises other questions when you look and study this. And um, again, you look at how covenants overlap, how you know, um, dispensations overlap, and you, and you wonder, you know, was he saved? Was he in the body of Christ? We've all looked at this. We've all thought these things. You know. And um, I just find that if we can grasp some of this today, you know, and then go to the, sort of the next stage, it just makes it a little bit easier. You understand, okay, yeah, he was in the body of Christ. In John 17, they were in Christ. They weren't baptised into the body until Acts 2 at Pentecost, but they were in, the, the body was there, maybe it wasn't revealed. 
There's a, like I said before, this book is a minefield. There's a lot of grey areas. You know, when, when you think you've got it sussed, then something else will come up and jolt you a little bit. He was, the, the thief on the cross was saved by grace through faith. Rockman writes, the truth of the matter is that the body of Christ was formed with the death of Christ exactly as Adam had his body formed when he, when he slept the sleep of death and Eve was taken from his side. The fact that the body did not begin to be built until Pentecost means absolutely nothing. The fact that the body at first contained Jews only means absolutely nothing. It was destined to have Jews and Gentiles in it and this is the mystery that was revealed to Paul after Acts 9. The fact that it was revealed to Paul after Acts 8 has no bearing upon when it started at all. It was three years before Paul was saved. His kinsmen were in Christ before he was in Christ. He persecuted Christ in the person of the saints in Acts 7 and Acts 8 because they were part of the body of Christ. This body is called the Church of God in Galatians 1.13. For you have heard of my conversation in the times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the Church of God and wasted it before he was saved. And we are told in 1 Corinthians 10, 11 and 12 that the church of God is composed of Jew and Gentile. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into that one spirit. So what has this to do with water baptism? Just this. Even if John the Baptist's water baptism was to manifest Christ to Israel, which it was, even if Simon Peter's water baptism for repentance was so that God could give the Holy Spirit to Israel, even though the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch was after he was saved by grace through faith, and even though the baptism of Paul was for purification of sin, the salient fact remains that the author and finisher of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ, was baptised in water. The eleven apostles also who followed him were baptised in water and wrote part of their New Testament they were baptised in water and Paul was baptised in water and baptised some of his converts. The apostle who said, be followers of me even as I also am of Christ, submitted to water baptism. And when Paul told a man how to get saved by grace through faith in Acts 16, he let him follow the Lord in water baptism. And although Paul was not sent primarily to baptise, he did baptise. And although he may not have... Um, he may not have given a clear commandment in the Pauline epistles on the relation of water baptism to the body of Christ. He certainly left the matter open and certainly set the example himself and certainly never repented of his own baptism or told anybody to repent of theirs. So it's crazy to say that water baptism is not for today. The hyperdispensation even goes as far to say that the breaking of bread, this ordinance, is not for today. All unrighteousness is sin, we read in 1 John 5, 17. And if it were not right to get baptised in water, water baptism is a sin, and I don't recall one place in the Pauline epistles where Paul ever confessed that sin. However, I can turn you to five other places where he confessed a dozen sins he committed before he was saved. In his great statement after he was saved, he said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. In his great confession of sin as a Christian in Romans 7, Paul never mentioned water baptism one time. Paul followed the Lord in baptism and rested in its content. He only taught that there was one saving baptism, that was the Holy Spirit, and that the same Spirit that put people into the body of Christ in Acts 2 put them into the body of Christ in Acts 8, 9, 10, 16, 18, 28, and up until the rapture. Baptism is, a, is only a figure of salvation according to 1 Peter 3:21. So to conclude, the hyper-dispensationists teach that there is a period of time called the grace of God, which there isn't, which began in Acts 9 for Stam, or in Acts 18 for O'Hare, or in Acts 28 for Bullinger. They don't agree with one another. Water baptism is not for this age, since this age began in Acts 9, or Acts 13, or Acts 18, or Acts 28. Number three, since Paul did not command anyone to be baptised, it is unscriptural. Number four, since Paul was not sent to baptise, water baptism is pre-Pauline, 1 Corinthians 1 they use. Number five, the one baptism of Ephesians 4 automatically cancels water baptism, according to Cornelius Stamm. 
The Bible rebuke of the hyper-dispensationist is this. The dispensation of Ephesians 3 verse 2 was the grace which God gave or dispensed to Paul to preach. Ephesians 3, 7, 1 Corinthians 3, 10, Colossians 1, 29. Grace was dispensed to him. The grace of God is found in every period of time. Every dispensation, shall we call it. Genesis 6, 8, Exodus 33, verse 13. So God dispensed grace to Paul so that he could understand the mystery of the one body of Jew and Gentile in the church. The church was before um, existed before Paul was saved. The age of the one body and the church of the one body began in Matthew chapter 27. Look at Ephesians 2 verse 12 and 16. With the twelve apostles in Christ. Romans 16, 7, before Paul was saved. And John 17, 21 and 23 which we looked at. Paul was baptised in water, Acts 9, 18, and baptised some of his converts. Acts 16, 33, 18, 8, 1 Corinthians 1, 13, 16, even though he was an evangelist. Nearly through. I know it's been a long one. It's hard hitting. You've got to have one of these every so often. Hyperdispensationists take Ephesians 4, verse 4 and 5 out of context and pretend that it's talking about water baptism being replaced by spirit baptism. The context of Ephesians 4, verse 4 to 6 is the unity of the body of Christ, not disunity, disunity caused by carnal Christians who say, I am of Christ. The same baptism that put Paul into Christ put Gentile believers into Christ. The same baptism that put the twelve into Christ, Acts 1, 5, put the Roman converts into Christ. Romans 6, verse 1 to 3 and 16, verse 7. And by the way, there are seven different baptisms in Scripture, not just two. And lastly, the hyperdipers, false teachings also include that Peter and Paul preached different gospels. We said before, if they did, Peter was accursed, according to Galatians 1 verse 8 and 9. God taught Peter the gospel in Acts 10 verse 43, which he publicly acknowledges in Acts 15 verse 11, while all are practicing water baptism. Number two, repentance should not be preached in this age. That's what they say. That's another thing you've got to watch out for, I'm telling you this now. Paul preached it constantly in Acts 20 verse 21 and asked exactly what, the jo what John the Baptist asked for when he preached it in Acts 26 20. Paul did this after writing Romans 16 verse 25 and 26. So if you get hung up on repentance, you've tarnished by the hyperdipers, the hyperdispensationist. But like I said before, if you're looking at repentance in regard to works, then I totally agree. It's nothing to do with it. You don't, you're not turning from your sin doing a work before you get saved but you are turning from something to Christ, in the sense of you're leaving your old life, turn to Christ, but you're just believing. That's the gospel. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. You don't have to do anything. It's a gift of God. You receive the gift or you reject it. Number three, the body, the church, the body, could not have been at Pentecost because no one mentioned it. That's what they teach. Neither did any mention the complete abolition of the law, the Levitical or the fulfilling of the law, Acts 13, 38 to 40. Though both were accomplished facts. You want to look up Colossians 2, 14 to 16 and Galatians 3, 13. Number four, Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20 is limited to the tribulation and that is pure conjecture. You need to look at 1 Timothy 6, verse 3, written to the saints in the one body. The all things of Matthew 28, verse 20 does not include all pre-crucifixion instruction which is apparent to anyone by comparing Matthew 10, verse 1 to 10, with Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, and John 13 to 17. The tribulation had not begun in 33 AD. Note, unto the end of the world. We're nearly through. Number five. Paul was deceived about water baptism and the one body until he wrote Ephesians 3, verse 4, which is after Acts 28. That is Tosh. Every Christian leader in the New Testament was baptized in water and none of them repented of it. So there we have it, job done. Don't get sucked into this cult. The hyperdispensationalist is it's a cult. Gary Miller is in a cult. He's leading his own little church and his own little cult over there in the States, and he is wrongly dividing the word of truth. And you have to be aware of these Christians that only talk about Paul all the time. And just to finish with in regard to this, because I was looking at some stuff yesterday.
just a few end notes, I should say. God dispensed a ministry to Paul and gave the grace to understand the ministry. That's what he dispensed to Paul. They said there's two separate Gospels, but there obviously isn't. And in regard to Galatians 2, verse 7 and 9, where it talks about the Gospel of the circumcision to the Gospel of the uncircumcision, um, Peter and Paul, uh, you need to look at the word of. Now, you who are good English will understand this much better than I can. And it's, you need to look in regard to uh, Galatians 2, verse 7 to 9, to the word of, to do with object or subject. Now, if you understand English, you'll get that. I'm not very good at that kind of thing. Object and subject. And Peter preached the same gospel as Paul did in Acts 15, verse 11. You also want to look at 1 Peter 1, verse 3 to 5, and verse 9. So there's no such thing as a period of time called grace, the dispensation of grace. It's more than that. Another interesting one was, only the Pauline epistles are for this dispensation, yet in 1 Timothy 3 you have bishops and deacons, and the hyper-dispensations do not have bishops and deacons in their churches. You had it in there, in 1 Timothy 3, one of Paul's letters. Also in 1 Corinthians 10, they, they, see they, make, they do away with all the Old Testament, they do away with anything that's not of Paul, yet in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11, it's speaking about Exodus and Numbers. For today. In Romans 15 verse 4, it's talking about Genesis to Malachi. For today. In Romans 16 verse 25 and 26, it's, uh, it's um, not talking about the Old Testament prophets. And you also want to note verse 7, which we said, the church before Paul. Another one they come up with, and we really are nearly through here, is um, they say Paul never preached the kingdom. Yet, oh, we won't read it now because of time, but Paul never preached the kingdom, so hence why you know, we, he never mentioned the kingdom. That's another thing they, they say. But if you look at Acts 14, 22, and Acts 20, verse 24 and 25, that will blow that out of the water. So God didn't dispense time to Paul, he dispensed grace. The gift of grace given to him. That's the key. And all the apostles were in Christ, in the body of Christ. Christ. So why do we have to say all this? Because like there's always strains and there's always errors in the body of Christ there's always you know cultish teaching and these have come, come up occasionally and we've had to deal with them and I just wanted to get that information on CD so those of you that do study and love the word of God that do study it can take those scriptures, run the references and just see for yourself. For us we, it's like somebody said, it's like um it's like a hindrance, you know, there's often times you, you, the, the main purpose in life is to get to know the Lord Jesus Christ the best you can and witness where you can. That's your life. Knowing the will of God, doing that, right? And um, all, this, like, all these little things, they're like little gnats, they, they, they just do your head in. They, they, in some ways, this isn't really that important, but it needs to be dealt with. So if you meet somebody, you know, we've done the Calvinistic, Calvinistic stuff, we've done the hyper-dispensation stuff, we've done the Pentecostal stuff, the tongues and the signs and the wonders, the evolutionary stuff, you know, those sort of things. Now we've done it, get it out of the way, you know, if we just put them to this, say, go do the study yourself. But don't get wrapped up in this, because the more you get wrapped up in this stuff, the, the devil's working in your life to take you away from what's important, which is reaching the lost souls of this world with the gospel. It was just something I felt I had to put down on tape or on CD just so that we can get it out there. Done. Good night. <laughs>